Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's Zoom event. Tonight's presentation is a continuation of our winter symposium titled Inviting Biodiversity into Our Gardens. I am Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. And I am pleased to continue our collaboration with the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium and Nature Spark to bring you this fall two-part virtual series designed to inform and inspire you to rethink your habit of rigorous garden cleanup. At the Land Conservancy, I develop nature-based programming virtually and in person for people of all ages. I'm fortunate to have an expansive network of conservation properties the Land Conservancy has protected in Northeast Ohio, which totals close to 70,000 acres of natural landscapes, family farms, and urban green spaces. With this collaboration, we hope to have an impact on the communities to transform backyard gardens and local green spaces into functioning beneficial habitats. My co-hosts, Anne Cicerella and Judy Simrock, are passionate about this topic also. Anne is the founder of the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium. She works to build connections and inspire conversations about the importance of restoring our fragmented native habitats, starting with our own backyards and local community plots of land. Judy possesses a wealth of knowledge about our natural world through her company, Nature Spark. She works with children and adults in the realm of nature education and exploration. She loves to share her nature knowledge through field trips and public programs both virtually and in person. I thank them both for working with me to bring you this series. During tonight's presentation, please place your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And we will get to those when Kevin is done with his program. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Catley. Dr. Catley is Professor Emeritus of Biology at Western Carolina University, where he taught and conducted research in organism, organismal Evolutionary biology. I knew I was going to have a tongue twister there. <laughs> he and a science, it's a long one. And science education. He holds a PhD in arthropod systematics from Cornell University and was a research scientist at the American Museum of Natural History. He's traveled extensively studying spiders on four continents and has held faculty positions at Rutgers and Vanderbilt Universities. While at Rutgers, Dr. Catley co authored the article Life in the Leaf Litter. As a naturalist, passionate photographer and lifelong observer of the tiny creatures that quote run the world. Dr. Catley gives talks and workshops at photographic clubs and societies where he encourages photographers to become citizen scientists by documenting and sharing their local arthropod diversity online. His research has been published extensive, extensively in a wide variety of scientific journals and his arthropod photographs have appeared online and in magazines. I promise to drop a link to Dr. Catley's photography website in the chat this evening. Without further ado, welcome Dr. Catley. Thank you so much, Renee, and thank you, Anne, for the invitation. Uh, I look forward to sharing it with you. So let's get started right away. You bet. Thank you. Great. Looks good. That looking okay? It looks great. Well, what I want to do this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is to share with you um, where I'm coming from in terms of why leaf litter is important. Everybody has a different take on this, and my take is a little different again, and it really is based on the communities that we find when we start digging around in the dirt and digging around in the leaf litter. Um, you have to put a little bit of effort into it, but um, it's the only way to really get a, a handle on what's there. Uh, so, um, this is really all about recycling, biological recycling, and the foundation of soil fertility, any soil fertility, really provides the greatest diversity of any terrestrial habitat. Yet we know virtually nothing about it. We know very, very little about the biota that lives there, um, how they interact with each other, how the community functions. Um, a lot of it is just based on, uh, not based on facts, because it's so difficult to study these things in situ. So 
uh, a good woodland area with uh, a good base of leaves that it accumulates each year uh, is what we're talking about. And if we get closer and look at them, um, this is a case of uh, an, oak, an oak hickory forest. Um, but essentially, it looks dry and barren on the top. And if we take a little bit of time and look underneath, um, then we've uh, can enter a completely different world. So it's been called a poor man's rainforest, and it really is. Um, and here I'm with a couple of students using uh, this contraption here, which is a sifter, a very simple uh, bag with a, a, a grid, a metal grid, a quarter inch in, in between the two bags. You pick up armfuls of litter, put it in here, shake it around with a handle, um, and all the uh, arthropods with the humus falls into this bag below. Then you can take this and put it into a funnel, which is the next stage, uh, which is called a Balazi funnel, also known as a Telegram funnel, um, named after entomologists. And this is a, a huge whopping size one that we had made at the museum, but you can make your own based on a, a funnel, a plastic funnel, um, one of these lights that you get for poultry. Um, the funnel goes into a container with alcohol in there. And the idea is that you put the, a layer of leaf litter in the top, put a light on it, and that provides the two things that these animals uh, detest, which is light and uh, dryness. So over a period of days, the animals will fall down in this funnel into the beaker. And then all you're going to do is go along after a few days, depending on how dry it is when it goes in. Um, and then you can see uh, the enormous diversity that we have there. And this is what you get, believe it or not, from a very uh, simple sample. Um, this was taken uh, in, a, in a schoolyard uh, underneath the hedges in a schoolyard when I was doing uh, education projects with children. So it's hardly... Um, you know, tropical rainforest. This is, it really is your backyard. And the majority of um, animals that we see here are these roundish uh, creatures, which are mites, um, and then a particular type of mite called orobatid mites. And they are the, undoubtedly, the, the uh, largest grouping of animals to be found anywhere on Earth. They're even found in Antarctica, one of just two animals that live there permanently. Um, so all these slightly different darker color ones, uh, there's even some white ones over here, are various types of arabotid mites, incredible diversity, as we'll come to in a moment. Um, these lighter uh, white uh, animals are calembola, or springtails, and these are the second most abundant animal on Earth. Um, you can see there's quite a size disparity between these and these long ones here. We'll be talking about these in far greater detail. Um, Here's another picture from a different sample, which uh, gives us a little more uh, feeling for the size involved. So this spider down here is probably five millimeters from head to tail. So that might give you some idea of the, uh, the rest of these. So again, we have the darker colored ones are orobatid mites. This is a type of calembola. Um, we have lots and lots of larvae that live in the leaf litter, uh, sometimes for several years. Uh, fly larvae and beetle larvae. Um, and you might just want to stop for a minute and think, well, what are they going to become? Well, they're going to become adult flies, which are going to leave the leaf, the, the leaf litter, or adult beetles, which will, you know, go off and when they're adults and they pupate in the leaf litter. They live there to begin with. They will pupate, um, fly, hopefully get mated, um, lay their eggs of, very often in rotting wood. Um, and then we'll start the cycle all, all over again. And of course, that provides fodder for a lot of other animals, for salamanders, for birds in particular with the flying insects, and spiders that live not in the leaf litter. Um, so here we've got um, a beetle. It's kind of twisted around, so it's a, it's a little bit hard to see. It's a staphylinid beetle or a rove beetle, which are predators. Uh, we find when we start looking closely at the leaf litter, there's an awful lot of predators. Um, and maybe not so many herbivores, um, saprovores, the detritivores, to feed them. But it's obviously the system is working well. Uh, but when you actually do the counts, it seems to be bottom heavy with um, uh, an awful lot of 
uh, herbivorous, uh, in, you know, uh, insects with a lot of predators to go with it. So here's a, a, a fly larva. Um, this is a, a beetle larva, I believe. Now here are other types of calambula. Here's another one over here. Um, this is a, a, mag a megafauna. Five millimeters is huge in the leaf litter. Um, so that'll give you a sense of these mites, which are, you know, a millimeter or less typically. So obviously in order to see these properly, you have to have a microscope. Now you don't need a terribly large uh, magnification. Uh, 45 is probably as much as you're ever gonna need and a, and a decent light. Here's another spider. Uh, this is about two millimeters perhaps or slightly less. And this, unlike this one, which leaves the, um, when the weather gets warmer, it overwinters in the leaf litter. But these live here all year round and breed, uh, uh, spin a little web, catch their prey, and uh, they're, they're all round, uh, year round uh, inhabitants of the leaf litter. More mites, there are other types of mites here, mesisting matted mites and uh, other types of arabatid mites. So it's kind of overwhelming when you first see it. And uh, when I show it to students for the first time, they think I've set it up. <laughs> they say, oh, you've collected all this stuff and put it all in during the night. Because <laughs> they don't believe that it came from the samples that they themselves just took in the schoolyard. It's really pretty amazing when you think about it. So, What's driving this? Well, each year an acre of woodland produces about two tons of leaves, twigs, insect frass, which is another fancy word for poop, and other debris. Um, and of course, while well, ba bacteria and fungi play roles in the ultimate, as the ultimate decomposers, releasing the nutrients back into the soil, arthropods, by shredding the litter into small pieces, allow decomposition to occur much more effectively. And when we talk about numbers, um, 40 to 50,000 individual springtails, these are the calembola that I showed you, occur typically in a meter, a square meter of leaf litter and soil. And mites are found in even larger numbers. Uh, Evans, who wrote a book back in the 60s, which has been reprinted in the 90s called um, Life on a Little Known Planet, which I would recommend to you if you're interested at all in insects, biology, fabulous book. Um, he scaled up these numbers and estimates that an acre of English pasture, here are the figures, 600 million mites, 250 million springtails, 17 or nearly 18 million beetles, and 135 million other sundry arthropods. So these are just gigantic numbers that take your breath away and, you know, begs the question, well, what's driving this and how is it working? It really is, uh, if you look at the ecology, the little that we know, um, it's a mind-blowing world filled with herbivores and their predators, parasites, parasitoids, hyperparasitoids. These are parasitoids that feed on other parasitoids and various types of symbiosis, mutualism. Um, and it's in fact a much more diverse world than a coral reef by some order of magnitude. Um, again, for scale, because it can be very difficult to get a sense of scale. Here we have a sow bug, which again is a megafaunal component in the leaf litter community. And this, uh, not an adult centipede by a long way, but a half grown one, um, which is probably about a centimeter in total length. So let's look at some of these in a little more detail, because these are just so important. Without them, we don't have soil fertility. We don't have trees, we don't have forests, we don't have plants, basically. It's as simple as that. Um, so these are the Calambula, and these are three different, quite uh, disparate um, suborders of Calambula. Long, skinny ones with long antenna, and fat ones with short antenna that live deeper down in the soil. And then these uh, lucerne fleas, uh, which are found uh, in various different layers of the soil. So springtails have the widest distribution of any hexapod group. Um, these, by the way, are not insects. We call them um, non-insect hexapods. They have six legs, but they're not considered to be insects for various reasons. But they occur throughout the world, including Antarctica. I think I mentioned this earlier, that there are only two things that live on Antarctica year round, and that's mites and calembola. How they do it in the permafrost is uh, 
something that we just really don't have a good hand on. But after mites, they're probably the most abundant hexapods on Earth, and up to 250 million per square acre. They also show a large range of ecological diversity, and they're found in soil, primarily leaf litter, logs, dung, caves, shorelines, um, even found high up in epiphytes in the tropical uh, forests. And there's only about 6,000 known species, which really is a small number uh, by comparison to other insect arthropods. Uh, but they play a vital role in maintaining soil fertility and are pivotal in most terrestrial ecosystems. Um, you might be interested a, a little bit in their biology. They're called springtails because they spring. Uh, if you start digging, when you're digging around in your garden and you see uh, this type typically gray, sometimes they're covered in scales which are iridescent and you just see them for a second and they'll sort of flip out of the way and jump. And they use it by, um, and their tail is this um, loose structure called a furcular. It's often forked. And in a retinaculum, which this fits into, and they release this spring, and this is under pressure from the hydrostatic skeleton and muscles, of course, and it flips down and throws them way up into the air. They also have this unique structure called a colophore, which is um, to do with adhesion and uh, water retention. Interestingly, they continue molting after they become adults up to 50 times, which again is very unusual um, for uh, an insect. Normally insects, when they reach adulthood, they don't molt anymore. So that's just a quick overview of the Calembola. So the other group that I wanna concentrate on simply because it's the largest group are the, the mites, the Akari. And here we see mites that don't live in the leaf litter. These are, um, I just put them in for interest, um, dust mites, which live on our human skin, essentially. Um, here are water mites that live completely in the water at all time. And this fella here, we all know the tick, uh, unfortunately doesn't feed in the leaf litter, but lives in the leaf litter. Um, and if you walk through a forest with leaf litter in the right time of the year, you'll certainly find out about ticks. But we're not going to talk about ticks tonight. We're going to talk about aurobatid mites. And this is the most um, numerically dominant. And you can see there's quite a diversity. Some of them are covered with very long spines or CD, um, uh, very globular. Others look like uh, a jumping bean living in a, a shell almost. Uh, others have um, little outgrowths on the side that look like wings. So there's quite a vast diversity here. And they're very ancient. They rose about 400 million years ago. We have fossils that go back at least that far. Here's one up here that's alive or abatted. And there are currently um, about 12,000 described species, but total estimates anywhere from 60,000 to 600,000. Some people would estimate even close to a, to a million uh, species, which is pretty uh, unbelievable. And they're far the most prevalent of all arthropods in forest soils, and they're essential for breaking down organic detritus and distributing fungi. All right, I'm having some a little trouble here. Okay, so they feed on a wide variety of material, including living and dead plant and fungal material, lichens and carrion. A few are predatory, but none is parasitic. These are all free living mites. Um, and feeding habitats may differ between immatures and adults of the same species. So you can see, given that uh, different ecological functions and the huge diversity that, it, that is there, sorting out who's doing what to who, when, is a very, very difficult task. Particularly when, as soon as you go into the leaf litter, you've essentially destroyed, at least temporarily, the, uh, the uh, habitat for them. Some of them are suited to dry conditions, uh, of bare lichen-covered rocks, but the larger section prefer the moist forest floor and its litter, and their contribution to nutrient recycling can't really be overstated. Um, another animal that is probably new to most of you, uh, Protura, that live in the leaf litter. These again are non-insect hexapods. They have no eyes. Um, they've lost their antenna, and they use their forelegs, which are highly modified and enlarged, as a functional antenna. 
And these are really tiny, they're less than two millimeters. We really still don't know much about how they eat. We know hardly anything about their reproductive biology. Um, they have no circe, these tails on the end, and their mouth parts are internathous, meaning they're inside the head capsule. They're really common in uh, woodland humus, uh, and it can be found as deep as 10 inches in the soil. Measured at 4,000 specimens per square meter, which as you can see is a lot less than mites, but they're still important. And they may feed on fungi, we, we really don't know. So those are the Protura. Diplura, um, again, loss of eyes. You might notice the pattern here. Um, they lack any pigment, most of them. Here you see one with some pigment. And they have two prominent um, tails, hence the name Diplura, two tails. Um, and that's one suborder. The other suborder has their tails developed into a little pair of pincers. They look like an earwig. But of course, these are not related at all to the insects proper. These are the non-insect arthropods. In soil, um, some are predaceous, some are herbivorous, and they actively hunt small arthropods. Um, pseudoscorpions. You may, if you, you may never have seen these in your life. You, you may have found them occasionally when you're in the garden. They, they live in leaf litter, um, and as you can imagine by their, um, their pincers, these are um, arachnids, and they are predators. They're usually less than a centimeter, so pretty big, um, compared to mites anyway. Um, they have no stinging tail, like a scorpion. But they're fairly common in leaf litter and under bark, but you seldom see them. You have to go looking for them. They spin silk from their chelicera, which are their mouth parts, um, and they have pincer like appendages with venom glands. Uh, they have a very interesting courtship dance where the male clasps the female. Um, and they're viviparous. They uh, keep the eggs and the young inside them on the embryo uh, and then the young climb on their back just like regular scorpions and they carry them around in the leaf litter. They feed on small invertebrates and inject venom from the glands in, the, in these uh, pincers or they're just like little lobsters and they, they walk like lobsters too. They're pretty amazing. Just give you some idea of the, uh, the uh, diversity that we have in them. They vary in terms of the length of their chela and the segments in their body and such like. Uh, a word, a passing word about parasitoids. Um, there are a lot of uh, hymenoptera, parasitoid, parasitic wasps that either live facultatively in the leaf litter or believe it or not, live there all the time. They've almost lost their wing structure. And this is a specific to um, the alfalfa weevil, which we wouldn't expect to find in leaf litter, but this is to illustrate the point that there's an awful lot of um, parasitoids, um, parasitizing insect eggs um, and different stages of insects. So here again is another uh, animal or order of insects taking advantage of the fact that of this richness that we have down in the leaf litter. So here's um, a fairly decent um, attempt to put some of those things together um, in terms of a, of, a, of a concept map, if you like, um, a leaf litter food web, where obviously sunlight produces leaves which die and fall. Um, we have the primary decomposers being bacteria and fungi, but they can't work efficiently at all unless there's organic matter breakdown by the secondary compose, uh, decomposers like the nematodes. And then they combine, they break it up into the large decomposers, millipedes, which we haven't talked about yet, potworms and earthworms, which are very important. The secondary decomposers, which are the mites and the springtails, which I've spent quite a bit of time on because these are the dom dominant animals in the leaf litter. Um, some of them are predators. We have 
predatory nematodes, which feed on whenever they can get hold of, uh, predatory mites, and here's our little uh, pseudoscorpion down here in the leaf litter. Also to consider are the large predators, the megafauna, the centipedes, which um, the soil, there is a group of centipedes called the soil centipedes that I'll talk to you about in a moment, um, that live in the leaf litter in the soil completely, totally for their entire lives. The spiders, which are, can be of a variety of sizes, and beetles, which uh, again, just that one group plays an awfully large role in uh, particularly with um, taking spores, uh, fungal spores, transferring them to different areas when they fly, but they take them in their mouths. So the storage of um, basically the, the uh, phosphates and nitrates and sulfates uh, are provided and broken down and then they're taken up by the roots and then the whole process starts again. So that's a pretty good, useful, I thought it was kind of useful to get a, get a handle on what's going on down there. So here are some other animals. Uh, this is from the Xerxes website. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it, but these are the larger animals that we tend to think about perhaps first when we, now you won't think about them first because now you know what's going on underneath it, underneath the leaf litter. But bumblebee queens, um, leaf cutter and mason bees in particular need spaces and tunnels. That's not necessarily um, leaf litter, but brush piles and hollow stems to leave are really good. Uh, hair streak butterflies, um, woolly bear caterpillars, which are arctiid um, moths, and then lunar moth capitals, uh, caterpillars actually spin their cocoons in leaves. Um, and I've certainly seen anecdotally a, a very great de decline in lunar moths recently, at least where I live. I used to see them, you know, two or three times a month. Now I see them once every three or four months. But so you can see. So now I'm just, I'd like to change gears a little bit and talk about, um, and if you have any questions about that part of the, uh, we can pick them up at the end about the actual looking at closely at the leaf litter. But you all know, I think that there's a, an insect apocalypse. Um, and here are just some headlines um, that I found to be sobering. Um, you know, we think about the grizzly bear, for example, but what would it be about the bee without the bee that pollinates the berries or the fly larva in particular that sustain baby salmon? And at least some of those would come from leaf litter. Um, we, we all know about the monarch crash, 90% um, in the last 20 years, and the rusty patch bumblebee dropped 80% um, over the last 87% in, in the same period. And a whole insect world might be going quietly missing a loss that would alter the planet in unknowable ways. And that's the problem right there is the unknowing because we know so little, we have so little base data on it. Uh, more studies, not just from um, this country. In 2018, um, there was a study published uh, from the Luquia Rainforest in Puerto Rico. Um, and the same group of scientists have been working from the 70s right up through the 210s. Um, looking at the drop in arthropod biomass and quote them the devastating numbers, a bottom-up trophic cascade and consequence collapse of an entire forest ecosystem, declines that have already been seen in the numbers of lizards, birds, and frogs, and of course other things that depend on them. But there's no habitat loss or pesticide use going on here in this rainforest, but temperature has increased two degrees Celsius in the same 40-year period. And studies show that tropical arthropods are unusually sensitive to temperature changes. You can imagine they, they, their whole uh, metabolism is geared to work within a very short, a very uh, narrow range of temperatures. And of course, living where we do, this is just where I live, um, the arthropod, not just insect losses, are very difficult to, to uh, assess. Um, and without, we don't have the baseline data, so we wouldn't know where to start. And that's, you know, an eternal problem. If we look at the UK, uh, up to 60% of common insects taxa have much smaller ranges in recent years, but larger trends are difficult to assess because we don't have historical data. In Europe, ornithologists have found that insectivorous birds are in trouble. 
partridges have disappeared, declines in nightingales and turtle doves, and half of, of um, farmland birds have disappeared in three decades. Hobbies, bee eaters, little owls and rollers that feed on larger insects have abruptly just disappeared. And this probably is the one that the, the biggest study that drove this whole insect ap uh, apocalypse uh, theory. Uh, German study provided longitudinal data from a, a society of amateur bug enthusiasts in the city Krefeld. And in 2013, they found that when measured by mass using data from 17,000 sampling days, flying insects in the 63 nature reserves that they were monitoring decreased by 75% over 27 years. And when measuring only the midsummer population peaks, the decrease was 82%. Now these numbers are terrifying uh, to an entomologist or an uh, anybody interested in, ath in uh, arthropods. Um, we see the same thing in Australia. So this is going on in all over the world right now. Um, the repercussions of insect extinction would be catastrophic to say the least. Insects have been at the structural and functional base of many of the world's ecosystems since their rise. I would go further and say all of them bar aquatic systems and some of those are driven by insects too. And they've been doing it for about 400 million years. Uh, key causes of the, decline, of the decline, habitat loss and conversion to intensive agriculture, pollution, pesticides and fertilizers, we all know this, as well as biological factors such as pathogens, exotic species and climate change. Now, I'd like to share this um, graphic with you. Um, it's one of my favorite. I've been using it for many years um, to give you a sense of why this decline is so incredibly important. This is a species scape, and each of the major taxa represent the, the, the phyla of uh, each of the groups. And their relative size uh, is a function of how many described species there are. So here we have the plants with 250, 260,000 described species. Here we have the birds, about 10,000 species. And you can go through the mollusks, the earthworms, the, uh, the nematodes, the fish, and so on. Um, here are the fungi, and underneath you may be able to make out a little elephant. That's us, guys. That's all the mammals. And over the fly, you know, dominating the entire species scape is this beetle, which in in actual fact it is less than a fungus beetle. It's, it measures less than a millimeter. Um, and this is all the insects, um, somewhere over a million species described right now. And here are the non-insect arthropods. So this would be the mites, the spiders, the pseudoscorpions, all the arachnids, and all the crustacea. And so when you combine both of these two together as arthropods, and we have about 1.4 um, million described species, you can see that um, it, it dwarfs all the other um, phyla of plants and animals that we, that we have uh, on the planet. Um, there's probably five to 10 million more species unknown to science. And we have that on pretty good authority. They regulate all the main ecological terrestrial and many aquatic systems on the planet. Without them, it has been estimated that almost all life on land, us included, could go extinct in nine months. That comes from E.O. Wilson, but uh, uh, several other um, pertinent scientists as well. Here's a quote from E.O. Wilson. It's easy to dismiss the creepy crawlies of the world. However, the value of the little things in the natural world has become extremely clear. Recent experimental studies on whole ecosystems support what ecologists have long suspected. The more species living in an ecosystem, the higher its productivity and the greater its ability to withstand drought and other kinds of environmental strain. Since we depend on working e ecosystems to cleanse our water, enrich our soil and create the very air we breathe, biodiversity is clearly not something to discard carelessly. And it, Wilson, Ed, like myself, uh, uh, are 
passionate and interested in little things, the little things that run the world, as he says, the creepy crawlies. And, um, sorry. Here's another way of visualizing that. Uh, if we take out the plants and the fungi and look at it from insects on all the major taxa, here we are, 1% of vertebrates, but arthropods make up more than 80% of animal life on the planet. More than 80% of animal life on the planet. Invertebrates, by the way, if we include all of those with the other invertebrates, make up about 97% of life. Let that go in for a little minute. Here we are, vertebrates, all the vertebrates, including the 25,000 species of fish, which is our biggest group, 1%. And we are all dependent on the functioning of the ecosystems that these uh, arthropods have been uh, intimately tied up with and evolving with for the last 400 million years. So other things that uh, are dependent in some way on the leaf litter, the utilized uh, leaf litter. Here we have wolf spiders that are beautifully cryptic. Um, these are daylight living in a, a diurnal. And so in order to make it on in the forest, they need to uh, have this crypsis and they're often running over leaf litter. Many spiders utilize leaf litter. Here are some jumping spiders that uh, hunt by visual, visual uh, means they don't, spin any webs for catching. Excuse me. And then predators. Tiger beetles. This one in particular is uh, the others use it for hunting. They fly from patch to patch, but this one is flightless and is uh, really, really intimately tied up with the uh, face lost its ability to fly and intimately tied up with its uh, with the leaf litter on the forest floor. Um, we've heard already and you hear more next uh, during the next talk about the moths and butterflies. I haven't uh, concentrated on them much because um, my interests are there's much smaller things in the mic microfauna as opposed to the macrofauna. But you can see the beautiful crypsis that we see here with this, uh, uh, the decorated owlet, which I've only ever found on leaf litter. And here's that same uh, beetle again, the leaf litter, uh, the uh, one spotted beetle. We haven't talked about millipedes at all. Millipedes are also shredders. They tend to live in the top few inches. Um, these are megafauna. This one is probably, uh, three, maybe four inches long. Um, this is an endemic that we, it's just a desmid endemic that we get down here in the Southern Appalachians. Uh, they produce cyanide gas, um, but very harmless, beautiful things. But again, they, they are intimately tied up with the leaf litter. And here's another one that's endemic down here that you obviously, it's aposematic coloring, it's keep away and, you know, I'll spray you if you come too near me. Um, but again, these spend the, the winter down in the leaf litter and uh, go into diapause. So they live for several years. And um, after a rainy night in particular, early in the morning, this is where you find them in usually great numbers on cruising around the leaf litter looking for things to uh, eat. So uh, I'd like to share a little story with you that's. Um, indicative and illustrative of uh, many of these topics that we've been talking about so far. So um, as Renee mentioned, I, 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 met, I worked in the American Museum of Natural History in New York for a number of years. Um, and this is, uh, if you've never been, please go. It's a most wonderful um, organization for science exhibition and education. Uh, and it's right next door to the Central Park, as you may or may not know. So when I worked there, um, a colleague and I one day were talking um, and we thought, well, I wonder if anybody has looked at the leaf litter 
fauna of Central Park. So we went to the research and we could find nothing, not a single article, not a single reference. So we thought, okay, let's go do it ourselves. So the museum has been there for 160 years and nobody in that time had gone over the road, literally walked across Central Park West into, into the park and started using the tools that I showed you earlier on to uh, collect the leaf litter, sift the leaf litter, take it back to the museum and start working it up. Um, the, one of the um, one of the products of that work was uh, this booklet, which is has a, uh, an urban um, biodiversity twist, um, but is full of uh, you know really describes all the animals that we found when we were there. But it uh, and it's got some very nice illustrations by um, not by me. <laughs> Um, by Pat uh, that show the interactions of what's going on down in the soil. And we've talked about lots of these already with the microfauna and then everything that else is depending on it, the fungi, the birds, um, <clears throat> a lot of the, the bugs and the Lepidoptera, uh, different birds and even raccoons. And of course, what benefits ultimately is the trees themselves. So, one of the things that we found in, this, in that study when, when we uh, went to do it, we, we did it over a year and we did um, four different sites um, and three samples at each over a period of a year. Um, we collected bunches of all kinds of things, but here's a headline from the uh, New York Times in 2002. Uh, they got really excited. I think it must have been a slow news day. Uh, they got really excited about what, what we, one of the things that we found there, uh, which was a, a blind soil centipede, one of the geophilomorph centipedes um, that we found um, in, in the leaf litter during that sampling period of time. And I had no idea what it was, except that it was a geophilomorph. And so sent it to an expert who also had no idea what it was. That took about a year. And then he sent it to some a group of researchers in Italy who, was, who were working and experts on this group. And they said, yeah, we don't know what it is, but it's a new genus. Uh, now, this is quite rare. We find new species of arthropods all the time, but a new genus of arthropods. And in Central Park, that was pretty much unheard of. Nothing new had been found there for well over 100 years anyway. Um, and what they were able to determine using phylogenetics was that the group has a center of diversity in Asia. It was introduced in the central part, probably in potted soil. We found both adults and juveniles. So that suggests a well-established breeding population. It's probably been there for many decades, but if it's a center of diversity in Asia, I don't know if sister species will live in Asia, then why wasn't it discovered previously in Asia? And why has it not been since? How did it survive the tough city life? And it's great. Uh, it's a great example, I think, for education about just how little we know with 3 million feet tramping over that leaf litter every year in Central Park, um, that we find this new, uh, a genus that's new to science. Um, it was pretty amazing. So there's been a great interest in the last five or six years, probably more, um, and you'll know more about this as gardeners than I do and land cons conservationists. Um, this is the Xerxes uh, sign, leave the leaves, which um, a lot of people seem to be getting on the bandwagon with, which is great, I'm all for it. And so this part of the talk just, just reiterates why we have to be so proactive here in encouraging arthropods in natural or cultivated ecosystems. By providing structural complexity and refugia in gardens, for example, spiders need a stable place to build their webs. Great examples are old brush piles or even old wooden boxes. Beetles, centipedes need places to hide, planks, flat stones, old bricks in the garden. Um, but the single most important component in any garden is leaf litter and lots of it. And remember, it's more than just mulch. And now you know why it's more than just mulch, because there's this, in a, at least in a well-developed, undisturbed, you know, if you're going to set little uh, plots up in, you, in, your, in your yards um, like this, 
you, you need to wait probably a number of years before it gets established and gets that uh, develops that huge level of biodiversity. So I'm going to give you yet another plea not to compost or burn your leaves. In particular, don't burn them. Um, don't contribute to global warming. They don't compost very well anyway. You know, they just get wet and soggy and horrible. Um, according to the EPA, over 10 million tons of leaves end up in the landfills in the US every year. And apparently it just gets too hot in these landfills. Um, so they can't compost and they just end up producing a lot of methane. Leave them where they are to provide the organic base of the most diverse ecosystem on the planet temperate woodland soil and leaf litter. Think about mulch in a different way. And as, as a source of arthropods to manage your garden, balance your so-called pest problems, increase biodiversity and strengthen your local ecosystem. And other things you can do to support bugs. Um, and you probably know this already. So I'm preaching to the converted, which is okay. There's one reason and one reason alone to plant native plants. So you guys, gardeners and environmentalists will cite many more and there are, there obviously there are many more, but really the only important is that they support and sustain more bug species. They really do. Non-native plants decrease insect diversity by around six times more than native plants. And if you've got a good, healthy population of bugs, be it whatever, even if it's, you know, some that are eating your prized plants. Um, that's the base for um, every lab trophic level that comes above, above it. Frogs, salamanders, birds, and so on. Here's another neat um, statistic. There's about 6,000 species of insectivorous birds in the world that have a total weight of about 3 million tons. It's an awful lot of birds. Every year they eat four to 500 million tons of insects and other arthropods. Thus the world's insectivorous birds annually consume about the same amount of energy as a mega city the size of New York, 2.8 exajoules. For comparison, the global spider community is known to consume between 400 and 800 more than all the birds in the world of insects annually. In fact, um, another little tidbit I can share with you is that the spiders that live on a hectare of eastern temperate forest up here in New York eat four tons of insects a year on a hectare. That's just over two acres. Uh, I can't even imagine what a ton of insects looks like. It's just unbelievable. They don't, they don't weigh anything, you know? So here are some, a few spiders that you might look out for next year in the springtime. This uh, spider, the orchard spider, is a very beautiful thing, um, but it, uh, it seems to appear first before any other spiders, builds its web as a tiny, tiny little spider with a red spot on it. That's about all you can ever see. Um, and this indeed is places to spin its webs, but it'll spin pretty much anywhere. But this is one to look out for. And in particular, if you've left dead branches um, near to the ground, uh, up say to four or five feet, you'll find this one early in the year. Some more spiders that I'm sure you're um, familiar with. The um, Aranus marmoreus and the Agaiope arantia. Again, two very common garden spiders that all they ask is a place to build a web. This one usually between plants, low down on the ground, so irises or any kind of strong grass, the grass itself is too weak to carry the web, but something stable that they can spin their web on. And this one will spin it on pretty much anything but higher up over, over four or five feet in the ground. Oops. Uh, you have probably seen this web, if you've not seen this spider. And this is a wonderful thing to have in your garden, to encourage to have in your garden. The spider is tiny about two millimeters, maybe three. This is a spider sitting underneath the web here. And um, any structure, any architectural structure that's stiff 
uh, so allow the web to be to sustain over periods of time. And these will take mosquitoes, they'll take just about anything that flies into that web. Um, this is the ball and doily spider, Ondinella communis. So dead flower heads, I see these everywhere again early in the year, and they will stick with the same web, providing it's productive for prey right throughout the year and just add to it so it gets bigger and bigger. And this thing might be five or six inches across. Remember, this spider is about three millimeters. Where on earth does it get that energy from to spin that web, which is nearly all proteinaceous? So it's a very has a very high metabolic cost. So interesting stuff. Now, if you have a pond, uh, you consider yourself very lucky because that will ameliorate lots and lots of your problems. So the ultimate predator, of course, has, a, has a, an aquatic lava that um, needs a pond, needs mud. I don't have a pond, unfortunately, but if you do, then um, this is a great, uh, a great re resource for uh, arthropods of all description. Um, I think I'm getting near to the end. Uh, you, you know about um, planting milkweed for monarchs, of course, and at the same time you get a, a, a bonus. If you're lucky, you get um, the, the red milkweed beetles plus red uh, Ligeid bugs that also live on exclusively on milkweed, nothing else. They, don't, they can't eat anything else, or they don't eat anything else. And of course, the um, goldenrod, which I have growing profusely around here for that reason. These are the locust borer beetles. Probably not so good if you have a lot of locust trees, but we do, and they don't seem to uh, cause too many problems here. So again, more plants, more diversity, um, more uh, strength in, in the ecosystem. Okay, well, I, I made it in time with lots of time for, for questions. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Catley. I loved yeah. your um, Central Park story. Um, it is amazing to find some a new genus. Can't even yeah, imagine. it was it was pretty amazing. And, and what I forgot to mention was that at the same time, during that same sample, um, unknowingly we collected um, three species of um, mycetophilid uh, fungus gnats, which are tiny little gnats that. The larvae live on fungus, and we gave it to the specialists in the museum who did flies, and they were three new species. Wow! Fungus flies. Yeah. So well, clearly, no one exciting... was looking at no one was looking at the leaf litter in Central Park, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got to be careful over there. There's a lot of things in the leaf litter that you don't want to find. <laughs> Believe well, me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Seg that segues well into this first question: What is the best time of the year to look at leaf litter? in northeastern and midwestern woodlands and forests? Well, any time before it gets really, really cold. It's not that it's not there when it gets cold, um, especially if there's a, um, a layer of snow over it. Uh, it seems to keep its temperature uh, at about 50 right throughout the year. Now, the animals that live there go down deeper into the soil when it gets colder. So you have to work a little bit harder to find them, but I've collected it under snow. Um, I've collected it certainly after the first frost, but like, like anything, there's probably more activity um, towards the end of the summer. Okay. So there, there were a handful of questions about the depth of the leaf litter. Like if you're a gardener, you're worried about your bare root um, plants. If they're buried too deeply, they, um, they might not grow. Is there, a, is there a depth that you can recommend for leaving the leaf litter in your garden? Well, I would, so, so, so firstly, I thought I had a slide that dealt with that. Um, I did, but it must have got chopped out somewhere. Okay. Um, <laughs> somewhere, no, no more than six inches, um, somewhere between three and six inches, four inches would be, would be ideal um, on the assumption that, that that's going to, see, uh, deciduous leaves take about five years to break down completely. Um, Evergreen trees with needles take 40 years. So wow. yeah, it's pretty amazing. So if you have a mixture of both, um, there's, there's different communities that live in say, like a white pine plantation where there's nothing else but white pine litter down there. You can find arthropods living down there 
mites and calambula, but they're more specialized. They break down a lot of the phenolics that are found in, in, in that kind of leaf litter. But um, every five years, you can imagine that the, there's a, a major turnover in deciduous leaves, oak and hickory. And so if you're able to set up a bed somewhere um, over and sort of you know, rotate it every year, just put some number. I, I'm not, I'm not advocating leaving leaves on your lawn, for example, and killing your grass, which is what's going to happen. You're going to need to move them somewhere mm -hmm. or in a bed of flowers or you know, underneath a tree, for example, if it's not too dry would be the ultimate place and okay. something that you would leave and just add, le add leaves to it when you're able to do that. Okay. So, so here's a question about fertilizing conifers, for example, um, should you feel guilty when disturbing the litter to spread the fertilizer or will temporary disturbance be forgiven? Boy, I suppose it would depend on what kind of fertilizer it was. Okay. I mean, if it's an organic fertilizer like bone meal or, you know, one of those things that's going to be in the soil for, uh, I think it's pretty benign. It, it, it lasts for a long time as opposed to, you know, chemically produced um, fertilizer that I I would think would disrupt the system. I mean, it's not going to hurt it dramatically okay. if you just use it sparingly once a year or twice a year. But if you keep on throwing it on there, it's going to cause problems in the in the community of animals that live there. Okay. And ultimately result in an insufficient breakdown into the into the um, components. Okay. Well, here's a, here's a really good question. Um, how do you suggest we balance the messaging of leaving the leaving our yards more natural with the growing public concern over increasing tick populations and tick-borne diseases? Hmm. Yeah, that is a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure that I have the answer to that. Um, you, there are various strategies that you can read about online. Um, And they all involve spraying with something nasty that, you know, um, I don't have a choice. I, I live in the middle of a several thousand acres of woodland and, you know, I'm prime tick meat. Like every time I go out or my dogs go out, yeah. especially in the winter. So I'm walking through leaf litter twice a day, every day, picking up ticks twice a day, every day. So it's like a part of living here. Um, but I think if you live in a place, I think you've just got to make the decision. Can you live with ticks? Um, I mean, one strategy that I've seen is to get a white sheet and to drag it around your yard for however long, however big a yard is, and it's going to get, if there's ticks there, it'll get covered in ticks. And then you take those ticks and you drop them in paraffin or whatever nasty stuff that you have mm -hmm. uh, to try and break the life cycle. But you know, if you've got white, if, if you've got white-footed mice around and you have deer around, you're going to have ticks. Yeah. It's, it's as simple as that. So you, the only way to break it is to get rid of all the deer or to get rid of all the mice, and that's never going to happen. Right. These yeah. mites, have, the ticks have been here too long. Um, again, that's another ancient group that goes back about 400 million years. So they've got it all figured out. So I'm sorry that I'm not, I, yeah. that I can't really, I don't really have an answer for that, but I've tried to, Taking the see, my, my problem is that I'm surrounded by it. There, there aren't any in my garden. <laughs> so, but um, if you can take this white sheet and just drag it behind you, you'll be amazed. You can pick okay. up hundreds. That's interesting. Well, what what about invasive bugs like Japanese beetles and stink bugs? What should we do yeah. about those? Well, I again, it depends on the size of your garden. Um, there are very few things now. Japanese beetles. Spiders will eat them, although a lot of people will tell you they won't. They'll also eat stink, stink bugs. Um, we get infected with uh, the marmorated stink bug, brown marmorated stink bug every year comes into the house in their hundreds. Um, and I catch them and drown them when they come in. And on J Japanese beetles, I do it out in the, in the yard, just go around in the early morning and tap them into a, uh, a container of water with detergent in there and they drown very quickly but i don't spray with anything so okay it you know that's in practice that's practical if you've got a couple of raised beds like i have if you have a large garden then 
it's very time consuming. But okay. spiders will take both of those. They're nasty, both of them. But, spi but web spiders will take them in their webs and eat them. Interesting. If, if we do have brush piles, should we put them in the sun or the shade? What's best? Hmm. Or does it not matter? I don't think it matters that much. It would, it would matter more at the time of year. Um, spiders have an, uh, an uncanny knack of, of spinning uh, uh, to face away from the sun. Um, so they don't get too hot when it gets very hot in the summer, but like it would be beneficial in the spring to bring things on, on a little bit. Okay. So I, I, I don't think it would matter that much, no. Okay, and, and there's a question about doing spring cleanups in your garden. Does that affect the leaf litter? Well, I think it depends. I think it depends what you what you consider or what you would do for a cleanup. I mean, I think if you have a lot of hollow stemmed uh, plants that look nasty, cut them down by all means, but leave a few for the carp for the. Um, the, the orchard bees and, and the like. Um, and again, don't disturb the leaf litter. Once you've got a system uh, in place and it's kind of, you know, you, you, you have your bed or your beds, whatever they're going to be, and you add leaves to it every year. Once you've got that system, don't, don't disturb that system as, as, much, as little as you can. Okay. There's a couple questions about if you should chop up the leaf litter. So like if you mow it and does chopping it up do anything beneficial when you're relocating it to other parts of your garden no in fact the opposite um okay i think if you know if you have it on the lawn and you know you, you, it's very beneficial to chop it up to mulch it okay if okay. you're not going to move it from the lawn because it'll end up being incorporated into that soil and do the lawn good but if you've got a bed of leaf litter going mm -hmm. yeah don't chop it up leave it entire because okay. by chopping it up you're going to kill a lot of things that live live on it Okay. You're going to chop all the bugs up as well. So um, someone also pointed out the opossums eat tens of thousands of ticks each season. So, so they see. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would be surprised that a possum could even see a tick, but I, I'll believe it. You, you know, one thing, it's come up in the Q&A here, Dr. Catley, and in, in Northeast Ohio, we're, we're glaciated here, and we don't have native earthworms anymore so all of our worms are non-native invasive right. worms um so people are asking about the effects of earthworms on leaf litter and it's well, pretty devastating for us they're, they're, they're the kiss of death basically yeah because yeah, they, they will suck down and and uh you know poop out i mean I, i've seen places but particularly in urban soils where it's an impoverished soil like like central park there are places there where the earthworms have been at it, and you just take off the top two or three inches of leaves, and all that's there are worm casts. Yeah. There's there's no soil. I mean, that will essentially be incorporated in soil, but it's completely barren underneath there. So worms are these invasives are bad news, and I I, I don't know how you would control earthworms. Yeah. Um, but, yes, but we we, we have the same problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. It's impossible. I, I have heard I've done that, the, Go ahead. I'm just going to say before I forget, I, I have heard the guinea fowl, if anybody has any anything to say about those, eat ticks. And I can imagine that because they, they're, they're very eagle-eyed. They see anything. Um, yeah. So you're going to cut the trouble as they squawk and awful. They're very loud. If you have neighbors, then yeah. they're probably not ultimate. But they do eat a lot of ticks. And then here's a question. Someone's asking about aphids and the role that they play in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they have a wonderful symbiotic relationship with ants, um, which well, I didn't mention ants in my, in my talk. I consider those to be at best, um, I mean, they're an important part of the structure in as much as they, they take seeds underground and distribute lots of different plants, but they have a structure, they, they have a, I mean, so aphids belong to a group, uh, the, the heteroptera, the, the, uh, the true bugs, um, 
that have their mouthparts developed into a sucking tube, all of them, whether they suck our blood, whether they suck in other animal, other arthropod, hemolymph, um, or plant juices, which is, I think, how it started off in the first place. So if you have a group of animals that are very important like that, you're going to have aphids or something to be to similar with them. And I think you just have to accept the fact that um, you're going to have aphids mm -hmm. and, and you're going to have ants that will tend them. And that's a good thing. But uh, I, I, early in the year, I get a lot of them. There's a, there's a goldenrod um, aphid that is specific only to goldenrods. I, I can't remember what it's called right now. And every year in the spring when they start, I just go out and spray them with soapy water. But again, that's a, it's a fairly big piece of them, so it takes me quite a while. But it, but that'll get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. This is the the last question we're going to cover here. Could you say more about developing a plot to leave the leaves instead of compost, mulching, or raking? I thought I was doing the right thing with composting or mulching them. Well, it depends what your what your ultimate goal is. I mean, if it's to attract more, I hate to use the word beneficial bugs because they're all beneficial in some way or to somebody, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, you, you know yeah. what I mean. Um, if you want to attract uh, and to stabilize and, and enrich your local ecosystem, and by that I'm talking about the food base being bugs, um, so many of them start in the leaf litter, either use it for um, overwintering, uh, feed, use it for all these ecological, um, these sort of trophic levels that we've been talking about. If that's your goal, then um, what, what, what I would do if you have some trees is to make beds around the trees, you know, or, and you can end up with a, if it's a, a, presumably you don't grow much on the trees because there's so much shade. You might have a few hostas or whatever will grow there and it tends to be dry there as well because you, you know the, the canopy um that, that's what i would do i would set up beds underneath and make them sort of a fairly permanent thing don't go walking over them too much mm -hmm. uh, rake your leaves there every year uh, you might end up with too many leaves but you'd be amazed how quickly they compress down actually okay. and you know over over the period of, of um a few years, you will have some incredibly rich soil underneath underneath that leaf litter and above in the leaf litter itself and the soil leaf litter interface, you have this incredible um, rich, alive, um, insect producing, arthropod producing ecosystem. So that's what yes. I would do. I, I spoke too soon that I said that was the last question because here's a good question. is. Commercial bagged mulch, good or bad to add to our garden beds? To add to the garden, what was the end? The commercially bagged mulch, the stuff you can buy at the garden center for mulch. Is it a good idea or a bad idea to spread that in your bed? It's better than no mulch at all. Okay. But I think it's, it's really dependent on... I mean, so much of it is peat these days, and we're all being told not to buy any peat products anymore with a carbon issue. Um, the mulch that I bought recently, is, it's pretty much nothing but shredded pine bark. You know, there's, there's no organic, well, no, what I consider to be good. And, it, and often it's, there's color and dye in there, you know, making it blacker or redder or whatever. Yeah. I certainly would avoid those types of mulch. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think there's, I, I think about maintaining a leaf litter um, area in two different ways. I would have set up an area between one or two or more trees and have it as a kind of a permanent nursery that's producing all the time in terms of arthropods. Mm -hmm. And then leaves that I had left over, I would use them as mulch in, in beds, you know, and go around and, and I think you have to be pretty careful how you lay it, depending on how many plants that you have there. But that that would do as you mulch if you have plenty of leaves. Um, don't leave it on the grass. Don't chop it up. Put it around plants, and you use that. Let that let that be in place of a uh, a purchase mulch. Okay. 
So, so here's another question. They, um, one of the viewers recently added butterfly friendly plants to start a monarch garden. And she's trying to use only natural ingredients. Um, last week, a bunch of quote, cranky bees found an evergreen in her yard. She's curious what she can do to encourage them to move on. Should she? Well, it depends what kind of bees they are. Um, <laughs> they're conifers. Did yeah. you say? Yeah, she said it was in um in an evergreen. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah. if they're if they if they're hun if if they're honeybees, they could very well be collecting um, exudates from the pi from the pine leaves to make propolis with. Okay. Which is the stuff that they stick, which is really antibiotic that they stick everything with. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only example that I can think of that I've seen myself with. We had a lot of um, uh, hemlocks uh, mm -hmm. one place that we lived, and it was always, but this time of the year, the bees are sort of getting ready to hunker down for the winter. So I don't know if they'd be honeybees. Okay. Uh, I mean, and I would, the first question I always ask when people ask me about bee questions is, is it a bee? And they say, well, yeah, it's, it's got stripes. It's a bee. And I say, well, is, you sure it's not a wasp? Because I said there are lots and lots of wasps, or it could even be uh, flower flies, drone flies that, mm -hmm. that mimic wasps. So it's really important to answer that question to find out what it is that's actually sure. visiting. Very true. Well, Listen, and if, they send, Dr. if they take a photo and send it to me, I might be able to identify it. I'd be happy right. to do that. Well, Sherry, if, if you're still on here, take a photo of your bees and, and send them our way and we'll get them identified for you. Everyone on this um, webinar has my email, so they're welcome to um, keep asking questions and I can get answers for you. We're going to wrap up for the evening tonight. Um, can, and I if I make, can I just make one, one suggestion? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. This booklet that you that I showed a picture of in the yeah. in this, um, it's available for download free from the museum. Um, so I can send you the URL. Yeah. And you can maybe post it with the with the photographs link. Yeah, I absolutely can do that. I'm gonna. I always do a follow up message after these webinars, and I will include a link to that as well as a link to. The Evans book you mentioned earlier, Life in a Little Known Planet. Yeah, so, that's a terrific book. And then I did put your photo website in the chat, and I will share that out whenever I do my follow-up as well, Dr. Catley. Thank okay, you so well, thank much you. for sharing your knowledge with us tonight. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. A lot of really good questions. Made me think with a lot of them. So great. It's a great audience. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What's happening? Am I out of it? No.